Hello, uh, welcome back to Science Shorts with Mr. Perkins. I'm Mr. Perkins, I'm a former biology teacher, I've worked with the National Park Service, I've worked with the Audubon Society as well, which is relevant to today's lesson. We're gonna jump right in to continue to provide uh, some little 10 minute science videos for parents, teachers, anybody who's looking for just a little break to help either them or their kids, and hopefully learn something new as well. So, like I said, I've worked with the Audubon Society. Today's theme, very bird related. We'll get to that in a second though, because we always start with our birthdays. April 15th, 1519 is the birthday of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we know him for a lot of things. We know him for his paintings, Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Most notably, we know him as, as an engineer. He designed bridges. Um, we know him as an inventor. Uh, and specifically with that engineering and inventing, he was really fascinated with the idea of flight. He designed several flying machines, and because of that, he had a lot of sketches of birds, both kind of identifying what their wings were doing, but also just cool sketches in general. Uh, and then, of course, that's not to ignore his time leading the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, solid guy all around, born this day in 1519. So, I've had two bird-related things so far, and the reason for that is because our quest, so our question on Monday started with how do mosquitoes survive the winter, and I ended up talking about hibernation and torpor in mammals, in insects, and in amphibians, but I kind of neglected birds. So today we're going to talk about birds and how do birds overwinter. Because we often think about birds migrating, birds going down south to warmer climates during the winter time. But a lot of birds stay here as well. You know, there's so many iconic pictures of those bright red cardinals against those white backdrops. And there are other birds that stay here as well. So how do birds overwinter? Because they don't hibernate. Uh, they don't go into a torpor at all. How do birds do it? So we're going to look at their strategies. I do want to quickly... There are two, two myths that occasionally I see, um, and I wanted to quickly address those. Uh, the idea that if you feed birds, they become reliant on you, and so then if you're planning on going on vacation, you need to not feed birds because you'll go on vacation, you won't feed them, and they'll starve. That's not true at all. Um, all of our research says that putting food out for birds doesn't negatively impact them. Uh, our current estimates are that even if you're putting out food for them, Birds only get about 25% of their food from a feeder. They still will do wild forage for about 75% of it, even if more food is available at the feeder. So birds are capable. Please feel free. Continue feeding birds, even if you're going on vacation. Uh, and then nest boxes during the winter time. I've seen people say that you need to take nest boxes in during the winter. Uh, you don't. Leave those out. Those are important shelter for birds. Birds use their nests, as we're going to talk about. So... Uh, even if you're going vac on vacation, keep feeding birds and leave those nest boxes out during the winter. Both are helpful for birds, but we're going to talk about some strategies that birds use outside of those myths. The first one's behavior. And I mentioned birds use nests. Birds use shelter in order to hide. So this woodpecker here, it's using its, its nesting holes in the tree. Obviously, that's out of the wind. That's going to be a little more insulated. Birds are capable of using those. That's very helpful for them. Um, the ruffed grouse. The ruffed grouse will stay under the snow for much of the day. So much like the woodpecker, it makes and finds a shelter. Uh, the ruffed grouse has a gigantic crop, um, which is a spot the bird can store food before it goes to its stomach. So the ruffed grouse can come out and eat almost all the food it needs for the day in about 15 minutes if it can find a tree that's got food, and then it dives back into its shelter, and it'll spend 16 hours a day easy inside this little snow cave that it builds for itself, staying out of the wind, staying awake, like it doesn't hibernate in there the, in there the way a bear might. It stays awake, but it has a shelter. It's not subjected to the cold that we think of. Um, and then... This this bird right here, one of my all-time favorite birds, the Clark's Nutcracker. It doesn't quite live in Minnesota. It has more of a Rocky Mountains range and then extending up north into Canada. Uh, but this Nutcracker, seen here, eating pine nuts, it 
is an incredible species. We often think of uh, bird-brained as an insult, and that's really not true, particularly exemplified by the Clark's Nutcracker. Over winter, it will store 98,000 seeds, and it will store them in caches all around the place. And each cache will have between 1 and 15 seeds. And that Nutcracker can remember those thousands of locations with near-perfect precision for up to nine months. That is amazing spatial memory. Uh, given the number of mornings I wake up and can't remember where my car keys are, the idea of remembering tens of thousands of different locations with exact precision is an incredible thing. But that means it's allowed, it, it can eat. It can eat the, those fat, heavy pine nuts over the winter, have that layer of insulation, and stay safe. Um, it's also great for the pine tree because the Clark's Nutcracker never eats all of them. And so the tree gets the benefit of the caches of seeds that the Nutcracker didn't eat are now growing new trees. And now the Nutcracker's happy because now there are new trees making its favorite food. But that, that ability to store food and remember is something that birds are good at in general, but particularly the Clark's Nutcracker is one of the most amazing species in the animal kingdom at that. So again, next time you hear somebody use bird brain as an insult, think of the Clark's Nutcracker. So this behavior protects them. Physiology. Uh, feathers. We see these, uh, these poof balls. This, uh, this, is a, this is a chickadee here. We see these poof ball sorts of looks to it. And here we've got a, a mourning dove with its, with its chest really puffed out. And when, when birds floof their feathers like that, it traps pockets of air close to their body and keeps them warm. Uh, and that's, that's very important. It's like us putting on a, a, a jacket, you know, that keeps the, that heat in so that they can stay warm. Very helpful, those feathers. And, the, and that floofing out of those feathers, you know. Obviously, you know, morning doves can be very sleek. We think of as chickadees, not as these little poof balls. But bringing those feathers out is enormously helpful for trapping heat and helping them stay warm. Uh, but there's another neat physiology thing. We've all seen uh, ducks or other waterfowl walk on ice barefoot. And if you or I were to walk across the ice barefoot, uh, we would get frostbite on our feet and it, we wouldn't be able to do it for very long at all. But ducks and waterfowl are able to do it with, with almost no problem whatsoever. So how? How are they able to do that? They have a neat physiology going on um, called countercurrent flow. So here, here the blood is coming down the artery towards the foot, and here the blood is coming up the vein back to the body. Now in the foot it's going to be very cold, so the artery sits right next to the vein and as the cold blood returns it gets pushed next to the warm blood coming from the body. So this warmth from the body gets transferred to this blood returning, which means the body doesn't get that cold because the body doesn't get that injection of cold from the extremity. It stays warm by keeping these pipes right next to each other. Uh, and then additionally, the blood vessels in the foot, there are very few of them. The, the bird's foot is set up in such a way that there's not a lot of living cells, and so it doesn't need that much blood. And that means the, the bird puts very little blood down into the feet, and even the bit of blood that it does put down into the feet gets warmed back up before it gets into the rest of the body. So there's some amazing physiology working in the foot of a bird in order to keep that working. And we can see over here, you know, if the body, uh, body of a bird kept at about 41 degrees Celsius, um, birds run a little bit warmer than humans. We think of as we think of humans as running about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Birds tend to run between 105 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and we're translating to Celsius here. But so 41 degrees Celsius is a little over 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and then down into the feet it can get close to freezing. But we can see you know zero degrees here, eight degrees here, 15 degrees here, and then as soon as you get out of the leg, it doubles up into the body. So this keeps the body warm while still allowing them to use their feet. It's a pretty amazing trick that allows waterfowl to just stand on ice with absolutely no problem. So that's physiology and then community. Community, birds, you know, we, we think of them 
uh, huge flocks of birds migrating down south, but huge flocks of birds stay together and keep each other warm and help each other when they're up here. Uh, this, is a, this is a branch of tree swallows that are all huddled together for warmth, the same way we think of people huddling together for warmth or you know, puppies huddling together for warmth. Birds are doing the same thing. When you've got big flocks of these species, they will help each other. And then I want to talk about uh, these, these eagles down here. Uh, bald eagles, uh, because a bald eagle chick will take longer to hatch than like a songbird chick, bald eagles have to lay their eggs in February or March. So these are bald eagles. Um, these pictures were taken in Virginia. And they laid their egg in February. And then a huge snowstorm came in March. So that's what we're looking at now. So in this picture, you have both male and female, both mom and dad sitting on the nest to keep each other warm and to keep the chicks warm. So they're working together, being good parents, keeping those chicks warm during the winter or, and uh, during those snowstorms. And uh, the, the full story, these two actually traded off during the night. Uh, the mom would sit on the nest for a while and then the dad would sit on the nest for a while, um, and then the other one would sit on top and warm them. Uh, and this, I just wanted to zoom in on, on this picture for a little bit. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is mom sitting in the middle of a blizzard at 11.47 p.m., and, and this, this look is, is a look that I think parents can simply...